Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Hunter Ohanian. I'm sorry, I just got something cut in my throat. And I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Let me just uh, reach over here, uh, turn my AC off over here. It's about uh, 89 degrees here in South Florida right now. It's been an absolutely gorgeous day. But anyway, we're happy to have all of you here uh, to join us for this um, a virtual walkthrough of our newest exhibition called The Saint. Um, and so um, it's a great time for us to sort of see uh, some things that we have in our archive and what's going on. To let people know a little bit about Stonewall, um, we have been around for 47 years. We're one of the largest LGBTQ archives in the United States. Uh, we're located here in Fort Lauderdale, uh, been around for 47 years. Um, in our library, we have uh, 28,000 volumes and my colleague, Emery Grant is standing by. And Emery, can you just turn the camera around and let people see. Um, so this is what 28,000 books of LGBTQ uh, stuff looks like. Um, it's fiction, nonfiction, biography. Um, it's really sort of an amazing trove. It's the largest LGBTQ library in the country. And um, it's really great to be able to see all that. It's actually after hours in the library right now. My colleague, Deputy Director Emery Grand is the one who is playing cameraman on this for us tonight. And I'm here at home. Um, in addition to the library, um, we have uh, 2,700 feet of archival material uh, in our archives. And just to give you some kind of context, 2,700 feet would bring you all the way up one side of the Empire State Building and all the way down the other. Um, and it's mostly from 1950 to the present day, and it totals about 6 million pages of materials. And so it's just an incredibly deep bench of uh, facts and, and things that happen um, in the gay world, uh, in the LGBTQ world uh, from 1950, really going back to the early days of the Lavender Scare, Mattachine Society, and Daughters of Bolitis, uh, One, the homophile movement, and all of those amazing, amazing things. And it's, it's, it's a true pleasure to actually be able to um, steward this information um, to the point where we can preserve it in a way that uh, f future generations or even this generation can enjoy. Um, if you're not, if also if you're not um, on our mailing list, you can join us by going to stonewall-museum.org and um, you can get our newsletters that come out every week. I promise we don't ask for money too many times, um, but you know we're a nonprofit like everybody else out there. And so it's an important way for us to raise money and to stay with, in touch with the people. We usually have two exhibitions up at any given time. And tonight's exhibition, The Saint, um, is just being launched today. Um, but last week, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago, we launched an exhibition called Off Our Backs, um, looking at early lesbian publications from 1959 to 2000. And so that exhibition is there. And for those of you who are in South Florida, uh, Miami, anywhere here, uh, please feel free to come by and see us. These exhibitions are open to the public. Um, but we also do these curated virtual tours uh, of them as well. And then also you'll see that we uh, will be putting up a virtual exhibition for both of these shows. I'm a little bit, I have a bit, bit of a backlog here on my desk, but those will be coming up this week. So all the images that you see here tonight as well as all the wall text um, will be available through our website at stonewall-museum.org. Also, if you have friends um, who are not able to see tonight's live broadcast, um, tell them that it's all being recorded. They can see it through our website and um, it's on YouTube as well too. And it's also will be available on Facebook. And of course, we want to do a shout out to all of our friends on Facebook who are, who are here as well too. Uh, these talks have been bringing in lots of people and so it's great for us to be able to, to do this. And officially, I'd like to just do a shout out to my colleague, Emery Grant, who is playing cameraman tonight. And just Emery, show yourself. Thank you, nice Welcome to everybody. see you. And uh, it's great to have you, to ha have you here. Um, so I think with that, let me sort of start in. And so this is the first time I've done a, a talk through of an exhibition where I have to be in an, another space and then where the actual exhibition is. 
And so, Emery, if we can, um, if if you can um, uh, sort of close me out and close my screen out, or maybe I should do that. I can. I got you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and just so that people can actually be looking at, thank you, just so people can be looking at some of the, the work here. And uh, let me just give people some background um, uh, about uh, the ex exhibition. And this is the wall text, uh, which is really sort of the curatorial point of view and place, places it in some kind of, of context. Context. I wanna thank my colleague, Robert Zass from the Saint Foundation, who is on the call with us here tonight who uh, he and his colleagues worked uh, a tremendous amount on making this show possible. Um, and uh, certainly for the text, uh, uh, it was a big help to us to make sure that we try to get as many of the facts correct that, that we could, could hear. Um, I think that's that's all I have, have now, but so let me go, go ahead and sort of dig in here. The Saint um, opened near the corner of Second Avenue and 6th Street in September 1980. It was the brainchild of Bruce Mailman, owner of the St. Mark's Baths, a successful gay bathhouse that had already been established in the East Village for three years. The structure that held the saint was built in 1926 as a Yiddish theater. It later became the Fillmore East, home to nearly every late 60s, early 70s rock and roll performer. Jimi Hendrix, Van Morrison, Frank Zappa, The Grateful Dead, The Almond Brothers, and many others once performed on that stage. By 1971, after a short three years of operation, the Fillmore East closed and the property was all but abandoned. However, after noticing the vacancy and considering the financial success and personal enjoyment of his bath, that his bathhouse brought him, Mailman, along with his business partner and architectural designer, Charles Terrell, pulled together a group of investors and purchased the Fillmore property. Together, they paid off, um, they paid off um, uh, years of back taxes and spent millions of dollars to create what would become the most spectacular discotheque in the world. For the Saint, set to open just four years after New York's famed Studio 54, Mailman wanted three things, unparalleled lighting and music, private club exclusivity, and a heavy emphasis on gay male sex. He believed that gay male society, as he understood it, deserved a safe, respectable, clean, sex positive establishment where men could step out of the dark, dark corners they had existed in for so many years. Mailman's vision was so prescient that New York gays bought all of the 2,500 private annual memberships before the club's opening night. The Saint featured an elevated 5,000 square foot dance floor under a domed ceiling, sporting more than 500 speakers. Shirtless, buff, mostly white men moved to the latest dance music, spun by the hottest celebrity DJs. A lighting apparatus with more than a thousand lighting instruments rose from the center of the dance floor and created myriad effects that range from a nighttime sky to a morning sunrise. In the beginning, the club was only open on Saturday and Sunday evenings from September to June. Its schedule was designed to jibe with those who summered and partied on Fire Island. The saint in the beginning did not serve alcohol and was open to men only as many as 4,000 people could have attended a given night. It became a destination of circuit party and A-list gays. The coat check allowed patrons to check their street clothes for more revealing disco attire. Regulars included everyone from Keith Haring, Andy Warhol to Leonard Bernstein. Illegal drugs were readily consumed throughout the facility. As part of Mailman's business model, patrons could easily walk the few blocks to his bathhouse at, uh, on St. Mark's Place after spending several hours dancing. At the time, gay male sex was considered by some to be at the vanguard of sexual freedom. Relying on the building's past as a performance venue, many talented entertainers, including Betty Buckley, Bertha Kitt, Grace Jones, Gloria Gaynor, Deb Debbie Harry, Patti Lapone, and many, many others performed at the St. 
The club showed films and offered theme nights like black parties and kink themed erotic events where a young Maple Robert, Thor Robert Maplethorpe was enlisted as the in-house photographer. Mailman and his staff regularly kept in touch with their members by commissioning overtly sexual posters. Some that you see in this exhibition are from Stonewall's collection. In addition to Maplethorpe, other artists who made posters included uh, Mark America, Rex, and Scott Fackham. By 1982, the effects of the transmission of the AIDS virus between gay men was unavoidable. The disease, I'm sorry, had begun taking a toll on the Saints membership. While some men were likely infected prior to the Saints opening, for a brief period of time, AIDS was colloquially known in New York as the Saints disease. By 1983, as we'll see here, the Saint hosted a fundraiser for the newly formed gay men's health crisis. It said so many members, it said, it, it is said so many members died in the early eighties that more than 700 membership, <laughs> there you are Emery, 700, uh, 700 membership renewal applications were returned in one year as undeliverable by the US post office. Change came quickly to, to the state. By the mid 1980s, the establishment shied away from the s and erotic fair and it became better known and embraced a more preppy vibe instead. Differences in aid awareness behaviors like black party performers only performing safe sex acts on stage were noticeable. In an attempt to increase revenue, membership costs were lowered, the club opened year-round, and women and straight patrons were admitted. Once annual membership costs had fallen to $50, the Saint was financially unsustainable. By 1988, the Saint had its final party. Mailman died of AIDS in 1994. He was 54 years old. Two years later, the structure was demolished, although the facade still exists today, and it was replaced by a residential housing tower. The Saint Mystique still exists as well, thanks to organizers who offer an annual event known as the Saint at Large in other New York venues. So Emery, bring me back up. And um, just to remind folks, if you have questions or comments or things you want to share, uh, please do that. Uh, okay, start my video. Thank you. Um, just to remind folks, if you have questions or comments or things that you want to share, please throw them into the Q&A or the chat portions. Um, I see people um, asking questions here. So just to remind everybody, questions been asked about whether or not these materials, uh, these materials will be digitized. Um, they will be available in a virtual version of this on our website at stonewall-museum.org. Uh, Stonewall is in the process of digitizing its entire collection. We just received uh, a large grant from the Mellon Foundation. And so that process is going on right now, um, or it, we're just be beginning that, that process. And so these these things will definitely be part of the digitization process, but you will still be able to see them through the virtual uh, version of this, which goes up online. Um, question was asked of me whether I have any personal experience uh, of the saint, and the answer to that is no. Um, it was not a time uh, that I was there. There was not a time that I was there. There was a time I was in Studio 54, but I don't remember having been in the saint, uh, so I can't say that I have firsthand experience in having been there but I'm sure many people on this call um, have. Um, so let's, Emery, if we can, if we can move the camera ah. over, to, uh, um, over to the first items here. And this first one on the top on the monitor is a, a little bit hard to see, um, but it, uh, if you can go just a little bit higher to the monitor. Uh, so this is a, um, is a uh, rendition or, um, of the interior of the saint. And one thing to remember is that the owners were not 
big fans of having photographs taken of the saint. If you Google it, you can see a few here and there. But remember, this was 1980. Uh, cell phones were, were not uh, that prevalent at the time. And I apologize for all of the uh, glare that you're seeing in here, but it is a beautiful artist rendering of what the interior lo looked like. And I want to thank artist Zuri Zhu, uh, who was responsible for, for this. And with the permission of the Saint Foundation, um, I would love to attach this to our virtual version of, um, of this exhibition so people can actually see it without the reflection there as well too. Um, if we can go now down below, uh, you can see the first poster. And again, all of these posters are in our archives. Um, we have a tremendous, and there are actually a lot more, uh, but this is really all that we have um, uh, from the, uh, that we, we all had, all that we had for, for room to put it in this exhibition. But this first po poster, uh, here you see work by Robert Maplethorpe, um, and he was a photographer for the Saints' uh, first and second rights events, which were explicit sexually themed dance parties and performances. Although um, Maplethorpe's uh, career had begun to gain traction by this time, uh, he continued working in nightlife as the in-house photographer uh, for another New York bar known as the Mine Shaft. Um, and he had he was well known because he had numerous photographs which had been printed at that time in Drummer Magazine. Um, so um, the questions I see coming up here is that the saint had alcohol from the beginning. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's great about, about hearing some of these facts because we sort of hear different things and research different things. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. There were small cans of Rolling Rock beer were included with the admission charge. And so uh, that is a great fact to be able to add to that. And we will uh, change our, um, our history of it in that way. Um, I also have a note here about please acknowledge that there were limited number of females that were charter members um, were welcome at the Saint from the opening season. Again, that's another important uh, fact uh, to mention here. Um, and I think it's, it's important for us to have these things correct and we will change what we have as well too. While the Saint certainly catered to gay males, it was not as anti-female as uh, it has been de depicted. So thank you for that. Um, and um, also to note that uh, with the dome lighting rendering, the, the lighting shown in that rendering is after um, Marsha believes the third season, uh, Mark Ackerman designed the trees that were um, over, over the four um, entry exits to, to the dome. And then uh, Kat Korvac is agreeing with Marsha on that particular point. All cool women were part of the scene. And again, I, I very much appreciate people co correcting um, the record in, in these ways. So let's go on to the next item here, and we'll keep on getting back to these questions and comments, but please, uh, please keep on throwing them up. And so with that next poster, if we can pull back just a little bit so the audience can see a full head-on version of it. Um, so this was, um, this was designed uh, uh, by uh, uh, Scott Facken, and um, it's printed on nearly, um, nearly paper uh, or nearly tissue thin paper. And Emory, if we can just see, just if you can get it so we can just do a, a straight on shot. Yeah, but don't zoom in, uh, but just get, give them a full sense of it straight on. Um, we see a poster from 1982 promoting Rights 3, the Black Party, uh, Strange Live Acts. Um, here you can notice Facken's near medical treatment of the drawings, uh, delivering a step-by-step -step instructions on how to perform an adult male circumcision and resulting corrective measures. As if the images are not graphic enough, Facken chose to add a needle and a thread to the poster to ensure the message was not missed. And so now, Emery, can you zoom in down on the bottom left-hand corner here? And again, you can see, so this, as this was folded up and sent out to people, each piece actually contained this needle and thread with, uh, with the uh, piece as well, too. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Facken uh, went on to have a successful career as a surrealist artist. He died in 2017. And for those of you who are interested in his work, you can see that at the Visual Aids site. So Visual Aids is a, a wonderful um, uh, uh, archive in New York. Uh, you can go to visualaids.org and you can see more of uh, Scott's work there. 
and they do a tremendous job. So the, um, the poster, the next poster that you see there is Night People. Um, this is a poster featuring singer Betty Buckley and in the role of Gris, Grisella, Bell, Grisella Bella from the 1982 original Broadway cast production of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cats. Buckley sang the, sang the well-known hit Memory, and she received a Tony for that performance. So for, for me, uh, the importance of this is the fact that, you know, um, Cats is so much a part of our, of our public cultural history in the United States, not just within the gay world, but really within Broadway. Certainly everybody knows this song. And Betty Buckley, who made um, Memory famous, was within two or three months of having performed it on Broadway, and she did, she did it for quite, quite a while, but the saint was able to get her to be able to be there and to be part of this. And as we'll see in the very last um, poster, she also performed at, at the last party as well too. So there was a long standing relationship between Buckley and uh, the people who, who were there, um, who were there as well too. Um, there's also a note here Two other notes just to point out to people that Jim Elliott has posted part of his collection um, on Facebook and there's a link for you to be able to see that. And then Marsha Stern has also posted uh, during the opening season, the lighting tower would begin lowered to the floor while the opening hour and all the classical music and light show. Um, as the dome filled with dancers, the lighting tower was raised to its full height and remained there until the very end of the party. And I do think, um, Marsha, I want to thank you for, for that piece as well, too, because with part of what we have read and seen, this really felt more like a party than it did like going to a discotheque. And, uh, and so I think that's, that's important that people remember that piece of it. So if we can go on to the next one, uh, this is one of the two images we put in by the artist Rex. Um, here we see a poster for the Saints Halloween party in 1982. Uh, the original artwork was by the artist Rex, um, a noted gay male erotic artist from the 1970s and 80s. He lived in both New York and San Francisco. He had befriended Maplethorpe uh, when they both worked at the mine shaft. While his work is known through many gay male magazines, the artist has been reclusive uh, for decades, never revealing his true name or year of birth. And Rex, if you're on this call right now, uh, please send me a text I, or a note. I'd lo love to hear from you. Um, and uh, it's believed uh, that he is still alive today and likely born in the 1940s. Now, in this poster, Emery, if you zoom in a little bit there, you'll see that there's evidence here about um, the saint offering films. And so here, the 19, so here we're looking at a 1982 poster, and the 1979 film Alien, starring Sigourney Weaver, was shown earlier in the evening, followed by dancing. Um, and uh, the party, the poster was likely inspired, uh, I'm sorry, the movie likely inspired the original art for the poster. Also, if you look close enough here, uh, if you just go a little bit further down, Emery, in that poster, uh, you can see that the Weather Girls were booked to perform their disco classic, It's Raining Men. Um, and uh, so the question has been made about, Emery, if we can reduce my screen some, uh if that's possible uh i can make you come or go oh how, how's that no i mean i can make you disappear or i can make you stay no you can make well i mean i have to keep keep on speaking but i just got rid of m myself so i don't okay. know if that works for everybody else sounds good here we go okay great All right. so i'll keep on moving on um so now next to this one is another piece um by rex and so if we can get a nice close up of that shot. Uh, yes, uh, or I'm happy that that worked. I think this is a good, good way of doing it. Um, and, according, and then this is another piece by, by Rex. Uh, and you can see this is called uh, More Strange Acts um, were presented. And the suggested dress of, of that evening was heavy. If you want to if you want to just zoom in on that part of the poster as well too. Uh, Saint Sunday theme midnight uh, dress heavy. Um, more uh, strange live acts. Again, we're going back to 1983. Okay, uh, moving along to the next one. 
basically what I'm doing, folks, is uh, we're just going through the uh, object labels here for the show. Um, so here, um, here in Circus, uh, 1983, to recognize and raise awareness of the impact of aid that the impact AIDS had on their clients and the community, um, the Saint uh, hosted a fundraiser for the gay men's health crisis. Um, if you zoom down in the bottom there, you can see, we, we can all see that. Uh, GMHC had been founded only a year earlier by Larry Kramer and others to address the needs of those who were sick and dying um, from the novel and unknown disease that affected so many gay men at the time. Also, um, on the left-hand side of this, and again, you'll see better digital images of these, you will see that Nona Hendrix, a cousin of the legendary artist um, or guitarist Jimi Hendrix, and part of La Patti LaBelle's first girl group, the Ordettes, was scheduled to appear that night. And let's move on to the next one. So another Halloween party. Uh, this poster announces the American debut of, time, of Lime, a Canadian disco band who had just released their first album, Your Love, which hit, the, which hit number one on Billboard's disco chart. They were best known for the hit, You're My Magician. I remember that song also well. Um, and so here, and again here, the other thing to notice as well too, is how the DJs were getting such good bit billing in all of these as well too, because the D DJs of course had wonderful followings as well. They were just amazing. Then let's go on to the next poster, which is um, another um, Maplethorpe uh, poster. And of course, now we're in 1984 and the impact of AIDS was um, all too obvious. Uh, here we see images from Maplethorpe's 1984 series, White Gauze, which was commissioned by the saint. And it offered images that while still very sexy, they emphasized the need to practice safer sex. A complete set of um, silver gelatins uh, from this series are in many collections, including the National Museum of Scotland. Beautiful, beautiful images. And of course, Maplethorpe had the ability to make these um, very sexy, uh, but also it was very implicit in what he was doing here uh, by trying to help people understand how to take care of themselves and others. Um, and uh, so also Jim Elliott pointed out here that the circus party was held after GMAC's benefit. This is absolutely right. Uh, Madison Square Garden and Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Circus. And uh, we also have uh, some original posters from that Ringling Brothers uh, uh, event as well too. Uh, we didn't put them in this exhibition, but that fact is absolutely right. And another nice note here about the Madison Square Garden benefit featured the New York City Gay Men's Chorus, uh, which is a fact I, I didn't know, but I think is, is absolutely tremendous. I uh, just want to make sure that we're getting uh, chat Q&As. Uh, okay. Um, oh, so a question was asked, and maybe somebody can throw this up into the chat. Wasn't the saint featured in a movie? I wouldn't be surprised if that's true, but if somebody knows the, the answer to, to that, that would be great as well. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on to the last two. Slaves in New York. Uh, Rob answered that question for us uh, very quickly, and so thank you, Rob. Uh, and we just got a, a, a big post up here, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, so we're now moved, moving on to 1986, and here is a poster of the Saints 1986 calendar, indicating that they were still operating on a September through June schedule. So in the upper left-hand corner, that's September, and then June is the last uh, bar going across the bottom there. Um, and if one looks at this closely, it's difficult in this uh, context to be able to do it. Uh, you can see the diversity of events uh, that happened every month, and um, there was certainly attention paid to the phases of the moon and the large parties that were scheduled for each month. Um, and so I have... Um, I have a few other notes here, uh, which are interesting to point out. It's wonderful about, about this exhibition or about this talk and, and this exhibition is that we have so many people who have uh, firsthand knowledge about this. So let me read the following note. Opening night was Saturday, September 20th. 
with a line waiting to get to uh, get in entirely around the block. Membership was $275, while admission each night began at $20. Uh, Peter recalls being um, interviewed to receive a membership. Drugs were regularly passed um, in the Lux bathrooms and sex was common in the balcony. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I remember standing along the back wall in a line of men with a passing crowd prepared to make their choice. On the dance floor, a large number of men had brought large fans and expertly flipped them for all to see. The white party was particularly popular while all parties came from a graphic uh, uh, invitation. You could rent a locker in the back to change clothes, but the clothes check up front was designed to handle entire wardrobes. These facts are just absolutely amazing. Uh, yes, of course, William uh, McNeely talks about there were lockers. We've said that. And, uh, and for some founding members uh, that you paid for year yearly and the balcony uh, for the saint was for sex. Um, so thank you for pointing that uh, as well. The locker room was private to members um, that had lockers and their guests. It was a seasonal lo locker, not that you rented it for the night. Well, that's, a, that's a good fact. Thank you, Marcia. And the invitations were elaborate and must have been expensive. Uh, um, they typically included the whole poster folded and sometimes also other objects. Now you can't fully see this, but, but Aura's point here is an important one. And you can see in some of these, you can see the actual fold lines. So the majority of the ones that we have look as if they were sent out uh, in, they were folded and then in envelopes that were then sent out in that way. But we actually have some that are folded and then the uh, mailing address is on the outside in the, in, in the way. But the early ones, clearly the majority of them um, were folded and put into envelopes. And so these were the investment that they made not only in, into the facility, but the way they communicated with their members is really an important thing to th think about. Again, remember there was no social media at this time. Um, a lot of this was through word of mouth. There was obviously advertising, the St. Mark's Baths was going on at the same time. Uh, some of you might be able to say, I haven't researched this piece of it, but there was probably a fair amount of discussion about it in the gay press uh, and the New York gay press, New York native and other publications uh, as well too. Um, Marsha uh, just said uh, um, that uh, for at least uh, for the first two or three years, everything was mailed to individuals in an envelope, which would make sense and consistent with what we've seen with, with these things as well, too. And Marsha also was doing a big shout out um, to uh, Charles Terrell for his amazing party decor. And he was, of course, a designer and architect, and he worked with mailmen um, in, in order to be able to make a lot of this happen. Um, and then uh, Rob uh, from the uh, Stone, or fr from the uh, St. Pitt Foundation points out that some of the other items used in the invitations were leather blindfolds for the first Halloween party, iron on patches and all kinds of expensive bond papers and boards. And they used a lot of silver and gold foiling. And we'll see some of that when we look at some of the invitations in the case. And it also goes to the point I was making earlier about the three-dimensional nature of these, when we go back to that uh, to that early poster by uh, by Scott uh, Facken, where the needle and the thread were included in there, um, and so I really do like the idea that from a communication, from an artistic, and from a pr production standpoint, they were adding um, uh, many things there as well too. Marsha uh, points out too that Charles was also a theater set designer with uh, La Mama Th Theater in New York. Um, so let's move on to the last one here. And uh, um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, and this is a little difficult to read, maybe Emery, if we can pull back just a hair. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's hard to read up above there. Um, but uh, actually, can you just zoom in on, on the top up there for us there? Uh, and it says the saint, the last party. Now, I would be curious if anybody knows um, whether or not they, they even allowed or wh whether or not they allowed a use of an interior shot like this on any of their publications. Um, and, um, and I think that that's, um, that's a, a, an important point that they were at the point where it was at the end of, of the, their run 
and uh, that they were actually showing it um, uh, there as well too. Thank you, Rob, for your pronunciations here. Um, it's F-A-C-O-N, uh, absolutely. So here's a poster for the last um, event. Um, and as we said, cameras were not allowed inside the site and no one had cell phones to document their surroundings. Um, and so um, it is a bit of a reflective look at what was happening uh, there. Uh, and this is, uh, as, as I, I pose there, it's probably one of the few sanctioned images of the saint pu published. If anybody knows any more about that, I would be interested in it. But it does give us a, a good view of, um, of the lighting tower and the domed, uh, the, the domed ceiling and the, deer, the dance floor are all clearly visual, visual here. Um, and then if we can zoom, zoom down on the bottom there, here you can see that some of the performers for the last party in the center there, you see the DJs, you see the lighting designers getting credits, and then look over here in the left, you see Betty Buckley's name here, you see Thelma Houston, uh, the Weather Girls, uh, Viola, Viola Willis, and a number of, uh, of important uh, points here. Uh, going back over here, um, is it possible to save the chat and Q&A screens? There'll be a good addition to our archive. Uh, yes, we do. Um, we do save those. And, uh, and so uh, this conversation is, of course, all being recorded as well, too. And it's one of the reasons, too, why we um, why we re read all these questions out. So we have an oral version um, um, as well. Uh, William McNeely points out the owner of the Trocadero in San Francisco purchased the entire dome structure, which William that raises, uh, oh, well, you answered my, my question, um, said he put it in storage and never used it, which of course my question was immediately going to be uh, what happened to it. And so it's interesting uh, to think about the fact that it might've been in storage. So Emery, I know your arms might be tired from holding that up, but um, if you can bring us over to the case and let's start on the ephemera side first. So, um, yes. So here, now these objects have all been borrowed uh, from the Saint Foundation. Now, some of the things that have been pointed out, um, I just want people to take a look at. So on the right side of your screen, uh, you see uh, an invitation. You can see the foil that people have talked about that's being used. You can see the heavy color printing. Above that, you see an invitation. And we've actually pulled out the patch which came with it of an American flag and Rob, you might remind me as to what invitation that came with. Um, and um, uh, that you see that there. Uh, you see something here for the, uh, the new St. Mark's Baths. And the center there, can you, can you zoom in for me, Emery, there on that center one? Uh, nope, to your left there. Oh, it's a white party invitation there. We see more invitations over to the left. And then look, look just above. The, the black box where it says the saint and then above it. So there's a membership card. And so there were these embossed uh, uh, embossed membership cards. And so um, Rob Zass fr from the foundation has pointed out that that uh, 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 emblem I was just talking about or that patch, uh, the party was called America. Now, if you can swing around to the other side, to your left, Emery, um, you can see some other objects in here. So all the way to the right of your screen, you see an invitation to the white party. Uh, I believe uh, directly ahead of us is a New Year's Eve party. And then if you stop there and just zoom in on the bylaws, uh, these are really sort of interesting. So these were these aren't bylaws in, in, the, uh, in the sense of what we think of bylaws of the organization, but these were bylaws as to what the members were expected to abide by. So these were, were almost like the code of conduct. Um, and um, Jamie Leo has thr thrown in um, that uh, um, I attended several black parties, thanks to my dear friend, then celebrated historian astrologer Michael J. Michael Levin. Michael was among a number of mixed disciplines, including tarot readers, psychics, uh, Reiki, uh, energy workers. Um, another memory is the stupendous entrance of Grace Jones, lowered from the circular opening at, a top, at the top of the dome where the vast mirror ball made its grand entrance. She was wearing one of her highly angular suits, which um, outline etched, um, her outline etched as she descended 
by a blue laser. That must have been quite a sight. Um, FYI, for what it's worth, we have reached out to Grace Jones's agent and uh, asked to do a Zoom talk with her uh, about her time at the Saint. Um, we've not heard back yet, uh, but stay tuned. Uh, I would love to be able to have a chat with her and do that virtually while we have this exhibition up. Um, so we'll see what happens there. If anybody has an inside track to that, just uh, shoot us a note because we would happy happy to do it. And then Rob threw up a note here about America was on Columbus Day in 1980. So that, uh, so Rob, to your point, uh, that must have been, you know, that it was it only been open. That particular party had been uh, only when it was open for about a month. So if we now move down to the other end, um, here is uh, something which I had never seen before, and. Um, there is a little book of matches there, uh, which thank you, Rob, and the Stonewall Foundation for providing those Saint match, uh, those Saint found Saint um, matches to us. But what you're looking at, that blue object you're looking at, is a blue cotton kimono from the Saint Mark's baths, and on the pocket there, it is embroidered Saint Mark's baths, and it is embroidered the same way across the back. And I have to say the robe is in excellent condition. Um, personally speaking, I have never been in a bathhouse in which a robe was handed to me. I only remember towels, um, but it is really sort of an amazing artifact of what that time was like. And we put it in, in here um, to, to really reflect the idea that going back to some of the core principles of what the space and, and the effort was about, it really was about being able to celebrate sexual freedom. And what I find so fascinating about this particular period of time is that for many gay, gay men, they were, um, there, it was just a, a period of invincibility and there was so much that was open to them and so much that was possible. And of course, what they didn't realize at that given time was that something was happening underneath the surface that was just so d deadly and, and led to the loss of so many people. Now, Emery, I'm sure your arms are tired. So if you want to set the camera down and sort of give us all a broader view, um, we can sort of uh, uh, see what other questions and comments or memories that people want to, to bring. Um, and also, just to let people know, uh, this is at the Stonewall Library here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And so we are located in a building which is owned by Broward County. Uh, we have about 4,600 square feet. We've been in this space uh, for about 10 years. Um, it houses the library and the archive, and we do exhibitions um, in two different spaces there, really coming out of the work in our archives. And it makes me very happy and proud to be able to say that we can pull these important objects out of um, our archives and be able to put this history, this important part of gay history on the walls for everybody to be able to see them. Um, Kate says uh, she's got matches uh, and a gift from Brent Nicholson Earl, the, the great. Um, so other questions. Um, and so um, Rob asked me to be sure to uh, thank Stephen Prevner uh, from the Saint Foundation as well. He's the owner and producer of the parties since Bruce died. So thank you, Stephen, for your help. Um, and uh, Richard Tucker says uh, hello to everybody here. Uh, other questions or comments? Or memories that people want to share? Well, good. Um, I think, uh, Emery, why don't you throw me back on here then, and uh, we'll do that. Uh, another question here about the uh, text on the wall. Uh, and uh, I'm still I'm still blocked here. So the reason why uh, the wall text says 81 to 88 in that text, it's because those are the dates of the objects in the exhibition. Um, and uh, but the wall text uh, d does speak about the fact that it was opened in 1980. Um, uh, but the the uh, exhibition uh, objects that we have, we we just um, the first uh, object that we have is from 1981. Other questions? 
Marcia says, thank you. You're very welcome. Happy to do it. Um, remind all of your friends and acquaintances uh, that this, um, this talk has been uh, recorded and they can see it either uh, through our website. Uh, it's on Facebook as well, too. Um, and, um, and Marcia, thank you. We would love to get um, we would love to be able to get, we, we won't add to the exhibition because the exhibition is uh, has been put together at this point. Uh, but if you would like to send us some stuff, we would be happy to add it to the archives. Uh, hopefully there'll be another exhibition about the saint at some point. Um, and, uh, oh, and you're local in Hollywood too. Well, drive it on down then. Uh, that would be great. And it'd be great to meet you and see you. Um, and also Rob, hopefully you'll be putting this on your website for the Saint Foundation as well. Um, and um, so Aura, uh, Rob says, sure, so he'll, he'll spread the news that way. Aura says the projector was basically a star, um, a star machine, uh, like an actual planetarium, which is great. And uh, uh, we have, uh, Carlos says, thank you for all these memories indeed, and has enjoyed the conversation with people. So um, let me go back and just check once more. Uh, how long will the exhibition, Jim, Jim asks, how long will the exhibition be up? It'll be up for two months. Um, it'll be up until the end of April. Thank you, Jim, for, for that. And uh, Richard says he has a few stories written out of that he would like to share with us that he's already posted on Facebook. Uh, Richard, we would very much uh, like to do that. And um, also, I would be happy to have uh, digital versions of those, and we can add them into the archive of objects. We like keeping all of these topics as, as rich and as deep as we can. If people are aware of oral histories, I think that's very important to, to bring to our attention as well. And so um, we want to be as, be as as deep of a bench as we can be with this historical stuff. A uh, question was made about how to make a contribution uh, to Stonewall. Um, Aura, uh, you are now my favorite person for reminding me to say, say that. Uh, please go to stonewall-museum.org. Uh, Emery can probably throw that up on the chat here for everybody, but you can find it. And like uh, most nonprofit websites, there's a donate now button and you can just hit that. Um, and, uh, and that would be great uh, if you would like to make a donation. Obviously we're a 501c3 and all uh, gifts to us are tax exempt. Um, Rob is saying that they will provide digital versions of the posters that they have and most of the ephemera. And so that would be very good as well too. We are in the process, as I said earlier, of digitizing much of our collection. And so that will be something that we will just be adding uh, to the digital archives that we have as well too. Um, and so if that's it, um, I think we might wrap this up. Um, uh, just uh, one final thing, if anybody has any questions or any, any uh, additional thoughts uh, that they'd like to share, feel free to email me through the website at stonewall-museum.org. You can, uh, my name is Hunter Ohanian, I'm the director and you can see me there and uh, you feel free to shoot me an email and, uh, and that will work out just fine. Um, so um, Emery, can we see you once more before we say goodbye? Nice to see you. Thank you for being there so late. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna shoot you that other e email in a moment as soon as we get off, you can get that out. I appreciate that. And I hope everybody has, uh, has a great night and a great evening. And, um, uh, and uh, we will see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>